On this episode of the AF Exchange, the latest rung on the CR ladder, a tax bill, and the economic outlook. As usual, joining us is Douglas Holtzaken. Doug, thanks for joining us. Should be fun. Thank you. So before we jump into today's topic, as usual, what's been on your mind? Well, I, I've been just completely frustrated with the discussion that surrounds the Basel III endgame. Yeah. Uh, you know, this this is the this was meant to be the finishing touches on the large agreements among the Western democracies on how to regulate banks in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So we got to roll the clock back to 2007, 2008. These agreements were reached in 2010, 11. Like we're now finally implementing the last piece. And when the Fed and the FDIC go to implement the final piece, they come up with all sorts of stuff that has nothing to do with Basel III. So it's a massive overreach. Um, they provide no reason why they need U.S. banks to hold $100 billion more in capital. They have new capital buffers against operations risks and things that, that never existed before. Now, if, if they had done some analytics that showed the risks here, the scale and how the capital minimize those risks, the, the benefits that you get from that, that'd be fine. But they didn't. They just lost this thing. So everyone was caught unawares. The banks are flipping out from small to large. They, they, they pulled more people, regional-sized banks, into this uh, than, than they had uh, previously indicated they would. And now it just looks like, you know, the big banks complaining about regulations. That's not new. And I don't know where we end up. But the reality is this is probably cost without benefits that will in the end be embedded in the cost of credit somewhere. And this administration loves to regulate. Mm. You know, we've, we've kept track of the numbers. That's, that's just reading the data. And, but this one seems especially pointless. And I, yeah. and I don't understand why they can't just say, okay, let, let's rethink and, and get something more, more targeted. Yeah, and this this is what you're talking about tomorrow on Capitol Hill, right? You're going and doing a hearing. Yeah, I'm business. talking at the Small Business Committee in the House, and among the topics will be the impact on small business. It's not complicated. Small businesses uh, need access to credit. Um, they they have relationship lending. You know, so someone has to believe in them. Yeah, beliefs have a price. You know, this guy's a small business, but I, I the cost of credit gone up. What are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, you're the main event for that one, but course you will be on the 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 panel with kevin o'leary who <laughs> everyone is talking about i don't know who is this dude i mean <laughs> he's, he's he's on some show shark tank what, yeah. I mean, what, what, is, what has that ever done we have a podcast yeah right I mean, right on. right it's got to be pretty much the same right <laughs> Well, I, if he asked, if he asked my autograph nicely, I'll give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, as your social media guy, I'm kind of like, hopefully, get a picture together so I can post it. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right, let's talk about um, some other things, namely the CR, um, the continuing fight over funding the government for which, by the way, has already begun, as we've mentioned many times on this yep. podcast. Um, you know, we've talked about some, this somewhat confusing two-rung uh, continuing resolution between you and Gordon have both been on to talk about that. Um, but now seems like there's some additional steps involved in all this. Uh, you know, so just start with, okay, what's the latest on the whole government funding? Okay, so, so the latest is that um, we, we are running out of time on the current laddered CR, where four of the appropriations bills would uh, run out of funding on January 19th. That's the end of the week. Um, the others on February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Um, so they've decided to buy some time and do a second laddered C uh, CR to March 1st and March 8th. Uh, again, four approach bills and eight approach bills in these two bundles. And, and there are really two different sort of questions to ask about what have we learned. So the first is the laddered approach. What have we really gained by separating the dates for these supposedly easier and harder to agree upon approach bills? The claim was this would give House Republicans who originated this idea better leverage in the negotiations. Uh, you tell me, does it look that way? I don't know. So I'm s skeptical of the need for laddered, like mm -hmm. more complicated, what are, what are you getting? And then there's the, the basic issue of what learning is going on here? Because, uh, you know, last September, it was clear the House and Senate did not agree, and neither was going to get their way, and so they CR'd it. And now we have the laddered uh, CR, and um, they still don't agree. 
do House Republicans really believe that they can get the Senate to agree to, in particular, policy riders, different ways of doing business, not just the money, um, in March in a way that they didn't in February or January or December or November or October or September? I, I, you know, at some point, you got to recognize that you got to compromise sign something that you might not love and move on yeah i mean and and now to make matters even more complicated we're even more into the presidential election and you can't oh, yeah. discon you can't you can't take that politics out of things at this point um and we're what te- we're a few months away from having to do the next fiscal conversation well uh, right and so what's going to happen to the fiscal 25 approach well they're just not going to do them i you know i i can tell you that right now yeah I mean, we're going to have a future pod- podcast where we talk about the laddered CR for, for May mm-hmm. um, <laughs> in April and because we'll have, a you know, failed again. Who knows? But when we get to, to fiscal 25, they're going to do a CR to the lame duck and basically say after the election, we'll, we'll take care of all these problems. And somewhere in usually in late August, early September, you get peak lame duck mm-hmm. where every problem will be solved in lame duck. And then after the election, you get reality lame duck where nothing gets done. Right. So. That is our future. <laughs> Can't wait to have that podcast conversation. That will be episode uh, yes. 140, 145, somewhere in that, na- in, like that, that. Na- in that area. Um, okay, well, so, you know, whether or not they get a deal done by Friday, what happens after the first deadline? Um, the the agency is funded by the, the first uh, four pro spills, the military construction, things like that, run out of money, and you get a, quote, partial shutdown. Nothing dramatic. We, we know from previous experience and from running the numbers that government shutdowns are in fact not an enormous economic shock Mm -hmm. so if you're looking for something that's gonna like knock the economy down this isn't it it's not doing your job it's a nuisance for for taxpayers you need services out of these things Um, it makes everything more expensive because you're shifting the timing and you got to pay suppliers to do that so it, it won't be a big deal but you know one hopes that it can get done in time if both the Senate and the House use all the time needed on the, on the books, they will they will not get done in time. But you can get an agreement in the Senate to not have any amendments and not debate it and then ju- sort of march it through quickly. If they do that, they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Let's talk taxes. And you wrote Let's about— Let's talk taxes. In, in, I love you taxes. Know, you, I know this is one of your favorite topics of all time. I am a former editor of the National Tax Journal. That is I, one of the great reads of all time. Yeah, I— um, you read, you do subscribe. I, yeah, well, no, I I subscribe to the Dish, which is my favorite great read of all time. <laughs> and you, you wrote about this. Will get you nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to get myself out of that pretzel somehow. Uh, the chair. So, anyways, the chair. Just to set the background, you know, the chairs of the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee recently announced an agreement on a $78 billion tax bill that would extend some of the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and expand the child tax credit. Uh, So just walk us through those key provisions. So um, uh, both uh, Democrats and Republicans lost things that that were near and dear to their hearts recently. So in the 17 Act, uh, businesses were allowed to fully expense, deduct 100% of the cost of acquiring capital investments. And so that that went to 60% uh, as part of the, when they wrote the bill, they had this sort of, shave down the cost so they had things expire so there was that one they went from expensing research and development expenses to amortizing them so you get less upfront deductions and interest deductibility became less generous for there's some maximum amounts of deduct- deductibility in the law so those provisions all got quote worse for the for the businesses on the on the democrat side they had this very rich child tax credit that was uh, part of their build back better effort they got it for a year and it went away um, so they've been clamoring to get that back. And so for a couple of years now, they've been negotiating the basic negotiation being, we'll restore these 2017 Act uh, pieces if you'll give us a bigger child tax credit. And they weren't willing to give it that big a tax credit, and so there was this, this sort of ongoing thing. Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Ron Wyden, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, have reached an agreement, but just them as far as we know. Anybody else, we're not sure. It is extending those things to 2025 when the whole 17 law uh, mm. starts to sunset. So they bought a little time. This costs about 
80 billion dollars roughly 78 billion dollars uh, to do this and they then pay for this which is actually quietly an important um, thing they don't typically do when they do tax extenders they haven't typically paid for them mm -hmm. so they're gonna pay for it and here's the amazing thing they're gonna pay for it by limiting new claims for this employee retention tax credit so this is a slight digression but this tells you the difference between taxation and tax policy when the pandemic hit among things they included in the cares act was the employee retention tax credit if you as a business held on to your employees even though you had a, a, a 20 percent dip in your revenues they gave you a credit against your taxes for holding on to your employees perfectly good incentive in 2020 should have gone away that should have been it one year done they then extend it uh for a couple of years so the people can go back and, and, and hmm. file for it retrospectively retrospectively filing for something doesn't change your behavior it's already done so the whole point was to change behavior and get people to hold on to their employees that happened in 2020 and it's over they extend it then they extend it again to 2025 and in between it becomes an industry mm -hmm. and anybody who runs a, a business or not-for-profit as i do and so every day i get cold calls emails about we can help you file for the employee retention tax credit <laughs> we can get you all this money yeah um this was scored originally don't quote me on the number 13 15 billion dollars that's what jct thought would happen 200 billion dollars has gone out the door there's no. all sorts of intimation of fraud in, in this and it's become an industry as i've mentioned so the irs has done two extraordinary things this year number one it announced if you filed this and you want to take it back no questions asked you can withdraw your claim for the the, the retention tax credit this is just giving people who have fraudulent claims a chance to, to avoid getting audited and, and penalized. Then the second thing they said is, by the way, if you want to just take 20% of the credit and dime out the guy who helped you uh, create the fraud, we'll do that too. So I've never heard anything like this out of the IRS. Wow. So they've done that, all of which you would think would really diminish interest in getting into this game. Nevertheless, they, they said, okay, instead of April 2025 as being the last day you can file for this, it's going to be the end of this month, January 31st, mm. 2024. And they claim that will save $80 billion and pay for this bill. Okay. Even after the IRS has said all this. <laughs> so this is sort of stunning to me. Yeah. This is an episode of one of the worst tax policies we've ever seen. It's why, um, it's why I and other sort of tax purists dislike these tax credits so much right they become permanent they get hard to get rid of them they've lost their original purpose they're just cash yeah. flowing out the door i mean it seems like it's very hard you know in any policy area especially you know tax credits once it's out there pulling it back is near impossible because near impossible so you're gonna take my money away from me and that's gonna cause so just get ready for um you know episode 364 when that when we get to that one i'm going to be talking about the inflation reduction act clean energy tax credits which will not go away <laughs> even though we no longer need them to right. to incentivize solar or wind or whatever will have become pretty much the industry standard perfectly economical no need to be subsidizing it it's hard to make them go away Interesting. it's hard to get rid of yeah uh, another part of this bill that or agreement i should say that is that 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 um that seems important is the use of tax policy to boost relationship with Taiwan. Yeah. Tell so, us about that. Um, for a while now, um, they've been putting together a bill that would essentially, um, let me back up. Typically, the U.S. will engage in tax treaties with sovereign countries that say, we're going to allocate the taxes to one country. The other, we're not going to have double taxation of, of business activities. So your firms do activity in the U.S. and vice versa. We're going to make sure they only get taxed by the appropriate authority. We can't do that with Taiwan because it's not a sovereign nation. We, we, don't, we can't mm. recognize it as a sovereign nation. That's the, the whole uh, diplomatic issue. So we reached an agreement with Taiwan that both would pass domestic laws that mimicked a tax treaty. Our domestic law would say... They do t activity here. We don't tax it. They tax it back there, and they do the same thing, and we get to the... So that's in this. This is uh, something to get that over the finish line. You can be sure China's not going to be thrilled about this. At, at this moment, we're trying to reestablish more normal relations with China and take the heat down a little bit. This is this is a poke in the eye, and, and presumably we'll hear about it. Interesting. Um, what's this... What, what I mean, you said this is, as far as we know, this is just an agreement between the two chairs. So what is the likelihood of this getting through Congress? 
low, I think, honestly. Um, no one's going to want to put it on the CR or some must-pass thing, so it's going to have to make it through on its own, which means you have to get to 60 in the Senate, where they, they couldn't even get to 51 with the, the an extension of the rich child tax credit. So um, is this getting down enough to be passable? I don't know. House guys aren't going to want it at all. Yeah. So the Democrats are going to have to carry it in the House, but are they going to want the business stuff? And so I, this this has not happened for a couple of years for a reason. And these two gentlemen getting together in it and finding a middle ground they can deal with doesn't mean the rest have. Mm -hmm. And so well, time and votes will tell. Yeah. I mean, we all we often talk a lot about, I mean, in the previous podcast, you know, we've talked about, you know, all the things we'd like to have happen between, you know, spending reform, sure. tax reform. Does this get the conversation started at least and making sure that's part of it? Or is it not even, is it too I, small I, potatoes I think for it's, that? I think it's um, essentially a truce till 2025 to have the big fight, mm -hmm. you know, and then, then, you know, what do you do? We have big fiscal problems. You get to the, the sunset in 2025. And how do you go forward on the pieces of the 2017 Act that makes sense, in my view, preserve them, and what do you jettison? Well, what makes sense and what you jettison differs in the eye of the beholder. So that's going to be a really interesting year. And we haven't seen this Congress have the ability to reach some sort of an agreement. The stakes are going to be much higher then. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, let's talk about the economy. Um, by the way, we're skipping the trivia question for today, so I'm not going to put you on the spot. Trivia question. How many times have we skipped the trivia question? <laughs> Twice now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the economy. Um, we've seen some uh, conflicting labor market data, um, as well as a hotter-than-expected inflation report. Um, that was last week, I believe. Yep. First, would you watch, first just walk us through uh, December jobs and the inflation numbers. So the December jobs report was top line, real strong, right? Unemployment rate changed, 216,000 jobs, uh, wage growth year over year at 4.1%. So that's average, average hourly earnings. So you just look at that and think, whoa, that's great. Then you look inside it and you think, well, maybe this isn't as great as it looks because 50,000 of those jobs are, are in the government and the rest are heavily concentrated in uh, health and leisure and hospitality. So it's not exactly broad-based job growth. It's sort of very narrowly growing. Then you go over and you look at the household survey, which is where we get the unemployment rate. It's a survey that's smaller in scale than the, than the survey of firms that gives us the employment number. But uh, that shows roughly 675,000 people leaving the labor force, not exactly a sign of strength, and 680,000 people losing their job. And so only by that matching up does the unemployment rate remain unchanged because you, you lost the job, so people essentially left the labor force. Um, that doesn't feel like a strong uh, a strong labor market. So, is it cooling? Yes. Um, so inflation's going away, right? No, you get to the December inflation report, and what you really get is something that instead of going down, is flat, pops up a little bit, uh, top line. Um, the core, which is the thing you, you want to stare at, was supposed to go from four to three eight and stop to three nine, and so the concern has always been that, you know, t the the the, the path from a peak of 9.1 to, to say four or three would be easy and from three to two is hard. Yeah. I think we're in that period. I think the right way to think about it is the Fed is now going to earn its money. Um, it has had the luxury for over a year of operating as a single mandate Fed. Let's go after inflation, raise rates, go. Now it's got to worry about is, is employment going to fall off a cliff? That's the, the uh, employment mandate, full employment mandate, and the price stability mandate. So they're going to have to trade off, and it, it's going to be hard through the first half of this year. It's tricky terrain. Interesting. Well, uh, we can't talk, as you just mentioned, the Fed. I mean, your thoughts on this? Your, uh, the, there's increasing expectations that the Fed will cut rates this year. Is that still sort of the thinking with these reports? Well, or? there's increasing expectation that I'll grow to be 6'4 and have a full head of hair. So you know, it's not all expectations will be fulfilled. <laughs> Look, I, I think the Fed might cut this year. Yeah. I, 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 and we've seen um, uh, voices like Governor Waller, who's been quite cautious, acknowledging that that could happen. But the notion they're going to cut in March of this year, preemptively, aggressively, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only way the Fed moves early this year is if the economy falls off a cliff. We get yeah. a January employment report that shows, you know, n no job growth or something like that. I, I, it's not that weak. It's weaker, no question. 
So if, if we don't get the economy falling off the cliff quickly, the economy sort of plods along as it, as it looks like it will, then any rate cuts are going to come in the second half of the year. And I don't think they'll be as large as the market seems to be, to be thinking. This is a Fed that from the beginning has said it, it wants to do too much as opposed to too little. It wants to be convinced we're back to 2% for sure. This comes down to the, your issue of your standard of proof. There are people running around saying, look, for the past six months, core CPI has been, core PCE, been at 2%. We're done, victory. Well, what's the standard of proof? Six months where everything broke your way or a year when some things might not break your way? So right. I, I think that's where the, where they are. Yeah, it'll be interesting. But I mean, It'll th- be contentious, I, right? It'll be, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, so I think, you know, our next, we'll obviously be talking about this going forward. I think our next podcast is right before that that ja- that January jobs number comes out. So we'll have to put a, put a pin in it and hope right. and talk about it then to see get a better idea of what it's going to look like. I I think the reality is we are going to be talking about this a lot in the spring just because it it's it's so hard to read the data in a decisive way on a month to month basis. It, that's how it always is. Indeed, if it becomes easy to read the data, that'll probably mean that something really bad has happened. So you don't want to root for that. Interesting. Well, Doug, thanks for joining us on this ice cold snowy <laughs> Wednesday here in DC. Uh it was a good it was a nice warm discussion. For us <laughs> great <laughs> all right i had to get some weather jokes in there but and so uh wait you're from Vermont. Mission accomplished. this is nothing yeah it doesn't mean i don't like it <laughs> oh there's a reason you moved here right <laughs> yeah. 19 below is still cold no matter where or 19 degrees is still cold no matter if you grew up with it or not <laughs> okay so thanks again doug for joining us my pleasure 